uh, these ideologies became visibly inadequate because they had no answers, no, not, not even they, have, they had debates on what to do with the current problems, how to address the new realities and new, new challenges. That, so it's like keeping saying, well, we have to go back into the past. We have to go back into the past. You can fight like that for some time, but not for very long. And uh, also, uh, Yeltsin's entourage was extremely uh, successful in uh, defeating that kind of challenge by uh, re-legalizing re the official Communist Party. Because the official Communist Party initially was, um, it was not banned, but it was dissolved. And that uh, gave rise to the new Communist groups and parties. But then they re-legalized or returned the original official Communist Party. Uh, most loyal members of the old party immediately joined this party, and so much of the power base of the new radical Stalinist groups was erased in a very fast way, uh, and especially, of course, after the uh, repression of 1993, because being part of the official party was kind of acceptable and not dangerous, while if you were part of some kind of suspicious radical group, whether Stalinist or not, you could be exposed to some kind of repression or at least some pressure. Uh, so, of course, masses of uh, loyal Stalinist old-timers to join the new party, which ironically continued moving to the right so far that it, uh, uh, that it did become, in a certain sense, a non-Stalinist party. Uh, why? Because uh, I think if, if, the, if the, the Communist Party of Russian Federation were a Stalinist party, it would be a tremendous step, step forward for this party. Because they uh, basically uh, uh, ended up saying that, well, Russian Revolution was a major disaster. Uh, one of the major, tra uh, the great tragedy of Russia was this revolution. Uh, that uh, Tsarist Empire was in a good uh, state, good society, destroyed by the evil Jews. So they ended up being quite traditional Russian far right for some strange reason, still bearing the name Communist Party of Russian Federation. And uh, if somebody reads uh, Russian, I very much advise you to get at the, web, at the website uh, called Rusots, R-U-S-O-C, Rusots, I think it's rusots.kprf.org. Uh, it's a, a website of Russian socialism. And I said, this is a proper fascist website. Nationalistic website. Yeah. Russian socialism, mean, it's uh, about how Jews destroyed everything. Uh, it's about uh, a bad guy called Karl Marx, uh, who uh, just confused socialists uh, with his reactionary cosmopolitan internationalist ideas. And uh, you can download a, a really brilliant uh, movement, a brilliant movie on, on the Jewish conspiracy. Uh, so that, that's the kind of stuff with which they ended. Though actually the, the most members of this party are not aware of this because they're apolitical. They just go to vote once in four years, just read, they, usually these are very old people so they put on their eye glasses, their spectacles, they just look where it is it's written communist, just make, put a cross near this, in this box and, and that's it. And, well, the number is diminishing, but there are still a few million people like that, and you can continue for at least a few years. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, and they don't even know what the party leaders say, and uh, they never read newspapers or whatever. So, uh, and finally, there was the third current, which was uh, most interesting. I'm speaking about mass currents. I'm not speaking about intellectuals. I'm speaking about the currents which really shape. Uh, certain aspects of political life. And uh, the third current w was something which uh, actually emerged after 1994, after the defeat of, the, uh, of this corporatist opposition and the, defeat of, uh, and the defeat of the Stalinist opposition, which was um, uh, their uh, wave of spontaneous riots and protests, or semi-spontaneous riots and protests, which were uh, very often their protests of workers, but which looked more like peasant riots, or peasant rebellions, like people just blocking roads or uh, going on hunger strike, 
like they didn't get their wages paid for like six months. Well, they did to protest. They went on hunger strike. So in a way, it's logical. <laughs> they had they had very little to eat anyhow. Uh, so, uh, uh, but well, it, it 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 sounds funny from the point of view of these people. It was not really funny, of course. But uh, but uh, these spontaneous prudence also revealed how little uh, class conscious was there, how little class organization was there. And again, uh, these uh, protests, they uh, achieved some kind of peak in uh, 1996 to 1997, especially after the presidential election of 1996, uh, when it became clear that no change was going to happen. Uh, already in 1998, it started declining. And uh, in any way, uh, that ended in, uh, in no result in terms of political organization. Actually, in some cases, uh, the protests were successful in the sense that some wage areas were paid for like two or three months or something like that. So uh, they were not without result. <coughs> but uh, they were not consolidated in any serious political or social movement. And then uh, there was the famous default of the ruble, the ruble crash. And after it, uh, Primakov uh, government came, which was called the Pink Government, with some kind of neo keynesian or semi keynesian measures being introduced to stabilize the economy, which did work. The economy started growing. Actually, uh, their um, uh, industry, uh, the, the, uh, the, the industrial output increased. So people started getting jobs. Also, uh, some wage areas were paid. So in that sense, uh, there was a positive change, which people did feel. And uh, that was the very end of the spontaneous protest and riot, because people did like uh, this kind of uh, policy. But then uh, uh, Primakov was kicked out after eight months, and nobody moved, because there was no social organization. In a way, Primakov calmed down the, the rebellion, and that was exactly why he could be kicked out himself after that, because there, there was no need for him to, to continue politically. And in the uh, first, five year, uh, first five years of Putin, the situation seemed to be extremely calm. Uh, and then, all of a sudden, in the situation of almost complete calm and stability, in January 2005, all of a sudden, as if from nowhere, a mass movement emerged, which continued for uh, less than a month, but which really shook the country. It was when, uh, in January 2005, uh, the uh, government decided to, as they said, monetize benefits. Uh, it's a new speak. It's a new speak. Monetizing or monetizing even, I think. In Russian, it's monetizatsy. It's a word which, if you, if you type it in Russian word, uh, uh, Microsoft Word software will not recognize this word and will reject to accept it. will start protesting, with it, uh, marking it with the red line. <laughs> but it's, in, there, but it's in, the, in the government papers, in the government documents. Monetizatsy. So it's monetizing the, the, the benefits. In fact, that was commercializing transportation system and some ser social services and so on. It was like people um, who ha were entitled uh, to have free rides on buses were uh, now forced to pay for their tickets. And they've got compensations. Uh, compensations were actually like for, I think, five rides a month. And uh, by the way, uh, these people who were uh, uh, the benefit, uh, the beneficiaries, the, the ones who benefit, the, the, the benefit receivers in these terms. Uh, who are the, these people? Many of them were, most of them, of course, were uh, retired people. But uh, not all of them, because there were specific categories, like uh, Chernobyl uh, workers, people who worked uh, in Chernobyl and who, who were still quite young. Uh, or uh, veterans of the war in Afghanistan, also quite young. Uh, 